The world watched in celebration when President Bill Clinton announced the realization of the Human Genome Project, the first survey of the entire human genome. In his remarks, President Clinton acclaimed the famous scientific duo who solved the DNA puzzle. It was not even 50 years ago that a young Englishman named Crick and a brash, even younger American named Watson first discovered the elegant structure of our genetic code. History books tell of James Watson and Francis Crick's discovery, which shaped biology. But it was British chemist Rosalind Franklin whose experiments paved the way. Franklin was a tragic hero who persisted in a segregated scientific culture, and her untimely death proved to be an immeasurable loss for science and humanity. But Rosalind Franklin's work on carbon, DNA, and viruses remain triumphs that far outlive her. Rosalind Elsie Franklin was born on July 25, 1920 in London to a wealthy Jewish family who valued education and public service. Contrary to her family's traditions, Rosalind found early passions for photography and science. I do remember that she loved photography and saying it makes me feel all squiggly inside. She had this scientific interest um, which I completely lacked and lack. In 1938, Rosalind arrived at Cambridge University, where her passions for science and photography came together into a genius for X-ray crystallography. This technique captured X-ray diffraction patterns on film, enabling calculations of three-dimensional forms of even the most complex molecules. Franklin applied this technique to experiments on carbon. Her work improved Britain's gas masks during World War II, earning her a PhD in chemistry in 1945. Her papers are still cited more than 70 years later. In 1946, Franklin moved to Paris to perfect her crystallography skills. But she didn't spend all her time in the lab. Rosalind um, loved mountaineering. She had a wonderful sense of humor. Although she loved the freedom and lifestyle of Paris, she returned after four years to London to accept a job at King's College. This and a new research focus on the little-known molecule of DNA propelled 30-year-old Franklin into an undeclared race to unravel the secret of life. Oswald Avery's 1943 experiments strongly suggested a link between DNA and heredity. But could DNA, with only six chemical ingredients, be responsible for the diversity of all life on Earth? Some thought discovering the molecular structure would lead to an answer. King's physicist Maurice Wilkins had already been working on that assignment with his PhD student, Raymond Gosling. Franklin's expert crystallography gave the King's team an edge over their competitors, Francis Crick and James Watson of Cambridge and Linus Pauling of Caltech. After arriving in January 1951, Franklin built a world-class lab for DNA experiments. While the lab at King's was integrated, social life in the lunchrooms were heavily gender segregated. She was a hard worker. She was independent. She had her own ideas about how she wanted to do science. And she wasn't all that well respected for it uh, during that time. But still, she persevered with her diffraction patterns. Each photo took 100 hours to expose and thousands of manual calculations to interpret. After over a year of experiments, Franklin and Gosling began their 51st DNA photo exposure on May 1st, 1952. It was this image that would finally reveal how life's blueprint is passed down through the generations. Photo 51 was the best diffraction of DNA ever taken, and the X shape in the middle is the diffraction signature of a helix. And she's written by 51, specimen as in 49, with holder centered over collimator, so as to include both 3.4 angstrom arcs. Indeed, Franklin's calculations for the size of the helical arcs were accurate. Despite her success, the boys' club culture of kings became increasingly intolerable. I remember Rosalind arriving at my house in London in tears. She was very deeply unhappy in, in, in the environment of Kings. In July 1952, she made arrangements to transfer. Franklin agreed to finish a report on her findings before abandoning her DNA work. Then, in February of 1953, Linus Pauling proposed a three-helix structure for DNA. But Franklin found several errors in his reasoning based on her unpublished research. Concerned that Pauling was near the finish, Watson visited his rivals at King's. There, unknown to Franklin, 
Wilkins shared her final report and her marvelous Photo 51. When Wilkins showed Watson that particular photograph, he had what he described as a sort of eureka moment when suddenly everything clicked into place and he went racing back to Cambridge and, set, and explained what he'd seen to Crick. And within a relatively short period of time, they'd got the structure of the molecule worked out. Later that month, Watson and Crick asked Franklin to review their proposed structure for DNA, a double helix of phosphates and sugars connected by the hydrogen bonds of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Franklin had written her own article a month before. Inserted by hand into the original text is the sentence, thus our general ideas are consistent with the model proposed by Crick and Watson. Indeed, Franklin's ideas were consistent with Watson and Crick's model because they largely based their model on Franklin's ideas. When we later asked to estimate how long it would have taken Franklin to discover DNA structure, Francis Crick responded, perhaps three weeks, certainly in three months. Watson, Crick, and Wilkins earned the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1962. At the ceremony, the only mention of Franklin was a passing remark by Wilkins. Despite the tragic disregard of Franklin, it was a triumph for humanity. We do research on everything from cancer to HIV AIDS, uh, to heart disease, to autism, you name it. And an awful lot of what we're learning about causes comes down to hereditary factors written into DNA. And if you really want to come up with a treatment, more and more, we're using DNA as the treatment. That's what gene therapy is. So it's everywhere. Leaving King's, Franklin joined Birkbeck College in early 1953 and began researching viruses. While working at Birkbeck, she proved that all viruses are nucleic acids encased in proteins. Understanding the viral composition made it dramatically easier to develop life-saving vaccinations. Her friend Aaron Klug would win the 1982 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for a virus crystallography project he started with Franklin. She probably would have won two Nobel Prizes, one in 1962 and another in 1982. But Nobel Prizes cannot be awarded posthumously. In 1956, Franklin was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. But she was too busy to die. Franklin pressed on for two years, continuing her work between painful treatments. One day, Franklin returned to her London home without the strength to climb the steps. She was admitted to the Royal Marsden Hospital. Ironically and tragically, it was mutations in her DNA, the ultimate cause of her cancer, that killed her the next day. She was 37. On her deathbed, Franklin was surrounded by papers and calculations, hoping to add to her 42 publications. Her prolific research led to scientific triumphs, and it is no longer unrecognized. Britain's Royal Society created the Rosalind Franklin Award for Women in Science in 2003. In addition, the European Space Agency's rover that will search for life on Mars has been named Rosalind Franklin, and Franklin will get her own 100 million pound center at Oxford in 2020. Our role is to, to really echo what Rosalind Franklin did, which is take a technology or a set of technologies from physical science and apply them to life science. Franklin would not have dwelled on stolen work or lost Nobel Prizes. First and foremost a scientist, she only wanted to do meaningful research. The greatest tragedy is an unanswerable question. What else would Franklin have achieved? Although the world may forget her name, it has been forever changed by Franklin's triumph. As a young Franklin wrote to her father, the joy of science is in the work itself and its ultimate reward the improvement of mankind. So I'm glad to know I've got some of what Crick and Watson described in 53. But the very highest ranking should go to Rosalind Franklin. She's the one who found the key. Walking through the genes 